for me, lithium and nickel are your two massive bottlenecks. Scale, quality, speed. We've got a structural problem in lithium. It's a structural undersupply, and we're just seeing it this year. It's just begun this year. What is your expected average price for battery-grade carbon and hydroxide for 2023? Welcome to Rockstock Channel. It is July 19th, uh, Tuesday, and we are very privileged to have, uh, for the first time on our uh, interview, Simon Moores. We've interviewed a few times over the years, Andy Miller. Um, we referenced, I think, the first time, you know, the price is right um, as a benchmark being, you know, the benchmark, and, and, and there's a lot of kind of pricing discussion in, in lithium in particular, you know, but, but also elsewhere. We've also had Casper Rawls on talking about cobalt, you know, a few years ago. Uh, I want to first say, Simon, you know, thank you very much. Um, we connected in London uh, in in May. Both you, me, and Casper had a very long chat, uh, you know, very soon after um, you know the tragedy that you know, hit my life, and, and it was just very meaningful and helpful kind of conversation and to, to know. Um, you know, I have so many friends in the community and, and globally, and uh, you, you very generously offered, you know, both Rodney and me, um, you know, to participate in, in, in your in your conferences, uh, and, and we're taking you up on that and, and, and went to the Washington DC one and, and very much look forward to, um, for sure, the the one in, in, in Los Angeles, your, your flagship kind of cathodes and, and anodes conference. I'm going to assume um, for our listeners that, that most of you know who Simon Moore is and, and Benchmark, uh, you know, who, who they are. Throughout the pandemic, you were absolutely brilliant with your EV fests, um, you know, a lot of free content, keeping us all educated and in the mix. And, and you invested into that downturn. As a Brit, to have as much influence as you have, you know, in U.S. politics is amazing, right? You know, so here you were, uh, I don't know, in 2019, and maybe even earlier than that, you know, testifying in front of uh, Congress uh, and lecturing um, us, uh, you know, your famous quote from 2019 that we are in the midst of a global battery arms race, which so far the U.S. is a bystander. A few months after that, you had your first kind of Washington, D.C. conference, which I attended, and now you've just had another one. That conference was two days. It was exceptionally well attended. The biggest event we've ever done, the quality of attendees were incredible. And, and for me, the, the quality of the agenda was, was something else now. We sent out five invites to five senators, hoping we would get one, and all five came back and wanted to speak. If we did that two years ago, that wouldn't have happened. But since COVID, the whole narrative in Washington, D.C. has focused on not just on supply chains, but on lithium-ion batteries. Every senator, every government department, all the way up to the United States, know what lithium-ion batteries are about and know how economically important they are to a country's future. And that's something for there's something we've been working on, as, as how you mentioned at start, for a long time. And all we do is, is just try to educate people with data and the real story of what's happening. I saw Janet Yellen today um, has created a new word. She's uh, in Seoul with LG Chem and is talking about friend shoring. This is the Treasury Department. Okay, you've had Jennifer Granholm at Energy. You've had the Department of Defense. It, it's unbelievably topical. At the same time, the Build Back Better Biden um, plan, uh, you know, was knocked down by one of the senators that you interact with, you know, Senator Manchin. But they're now talking about, you know, being aggressive with executive orders and and the like. Jigger Shah uh, presented at, at your conference. Um, uh, he's at the loan programs office. He's talking about, I don't know how many billions of applications that he is processing. They've made one loan to, in, in the battery material space, to Syrah for a, a U.S. Um, uh, graphite processing graphite anode um you know processing plant and then the department of defense has actually given a grant to linus for a processing facility i think in in texas so you you started to you've seen two small but i get a sense that there you know is a lot more coming um the bipartisan infrastructure bill um i think allocated 3.6 billion dollars in grants you know for battery mineral processing and there's a lot of uh, you know applications in but i think the biden administration indicated uh they may make some decisions on that you know in october what's your thought process on, on where we may see dollars allocated by the u.s government 
I think it's the entire upstream of the supply chain. The way the government are thinking and the way the government move is always from, it's never from a mining perspective, it's always from downstream slowly to upstream to the mine. And, you know, there is a strong understanding in every department now that, that you can't just build the mine without having the market there. It's just really simple. And what we've seen over the last two years, since COVID especially, is is this global battery arms race arriving in the US and lots of capacity being built or being planned. Um, LG, SK, of course, you've just seen Panasonic now announce a, a, a new gigafactory in Kansas. And so that downstream is pretty much covered now from, from a battery and EV perspective. The problem is a gigafactory uh, without raw materials and chemicals, uh, secure supply of these, it was useful as a grain silo. It's, that's something I said uh, a few years ago to, um, to, uh, to the government, and, and it's never truer than now. The upside of what we're seeing at present is we finally have a number, a gigawatt hour number, a, a plan for the next 10 years for the USA going forward. In our pipeline, we've got 724 gigawatt hours. That needs to triple for the US at least if they're going to keep pace uh, or let's say keep pace with China or at least build a proper EV industry. Um, so from my perspective, at least there's a number to anchor new mines, new chemical plants onto. And that's where the government can step in to help oil the wheels. Um, so I think the government will allocate money at a mine level and I think will allocate money at that chemical um, stage, lithium, stage level, lithium hydroxide, nickel sulfate, cobalt sulfate, things like this. I don't think, I, it'd be interesting to see if there's cathodes and anode money that come in. Syra mentioned, which is interesting, that's needed. Will they put money in the cathode space? We'll, we'll wait to see, but I certainly expect and anticipate mine level money and chemical plant level money coming in. Into nickel, lithium and cobalt. And possibly yeah back. i think i think those three are the the big ones i think the syra anode um deal was really was really important i think to have that anode natural graphite anode processing capacity in the us and um, there's 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 synthetic anode capacity being built which is good but you need both and so so for me it's lithium nickel cobalt are uh, in the sites but in the case of Syra and Linus, I mean, they're Australian companies. The funding was for U.S. operations. You were just in Sydney um, at, at, at an energy forum, uh, you know, that Jennifer Granholm spoke at. She was talking about we can't allow, you know, critical raw materials to be weaponized, you know, and us being vulnerable. That There's very much, you know, an interest in, in partnership with Australia, you know, with Canada. Uh, could you see the U.S. government ever funding projects outside of America? Yeah, that, 100%. I, th I think that... The U.S. departments have, got, have gone on record, and certainly the Department of Defense recently have, have put legislation legislation into can't say it properly uh, legislation into uh, the Senate. I don't think it's been passed yet uh, to to make countries like Australia, Canada, um, uh, domestic sources. I know there's been categorization in the past in, in in various departments, but I do think the U.S or now view Australia, Canada especially, as, as domestic sources, and therefore that opens up those projects to money as well. And I think that's a good thing, because actually what I can see evolving is a new trade block for battery raw materials. I think that's really important. So you've got the US, which is leading this and pushing on all fronts um, in terms of different departments. And then um, certainly when Jennifer Granholm and her team were in, were in Australia, they were signing deals to uh, signing agreements to to create framework for a new trade block for key battery raw materials and so i think this is uh crucial to one country can't do it alone and you have to kind of bring together the best bits of both worlds to build these new supply chains and i think now the us is evolving certainly from just a us centric uh strategy to a trade block strategy and i think that's definitely one to watch that's interesting because I know um, there's always been developing market aid, right? So through the USAID and and, and other um, loan programs, kind of like China's Belt and Road, but it was always like, these are poor countries. They don't have the money. We're going to support them. But here you're saying developed economies could get US loans from, and, it's, it's, it, it, and they're perceived to be domestic sources. If the US starts funding X, us you know projects what does that you know potentially mean for projects in the us well you need both you're going to need 
so much lithium, so much nickel, a good amount of cobalt, that everything's in play. And the question is, for me, the question is speed and scale. And if legislation, um, let's say like permitting issues, um, state level issues or, or the BLM issues, um, Bureau of Land Management issues that you have in the US, if that continues to bog down um, US projects, then it makes sense to partner with Australian um, companies, Australian mines, partner with the Canadian mines um, and build quicker effectively. Now, of course, the US wants domestic raw material mining and processing, but my fear is that that's slowing um, in terms of a legislation perspective. And you need, you need lithium, you need what hundreds of thousands of tons of lithium in the pipeline two years ago. You know, now um, we're well behind in what we wanted to achieve. And so I think everything's in play, uh, hence coming back to this trade block kind of argument or trade block sort of community that's being built in front of our eyes. So uh, Simon, Elon Musk recently mentioned in an interview that Tesla is unlikely to pursue lithium mining and processing. He gave some reasoning around staff and around complexity, but now we're seeing Panasonic having a plan to expand to two terawatt hours of battery production and, and Tesla being behind that. Is, it, is this a case of now Tesla sort of passing the buck to Panasonic now to source the raw materials for them? Feels that way. I, I always think that Tesla mining, to be honest, from, from a cultural perspective and an Elon Musk perspective, it actually made sense that Tesla would, would try and learn the mining game. The problem is um, when Tesla mentioned they were going to, uh, to nickel refining and lithium refining in the, on battery day in the Austin Gigafactory, uh, which they still haven't done, by the way, still haven't started building that, uh, those components in, in Austin. Um, but when they mentioned that, it kind of made sense, um, but alarm bells were ringing, especially for you guys, and it would have been for me, that you're going from fit like physical engineering and software into chemical engineering and mining, and they are two completely different worlds. And so whilst it's, it's a very Elon Musk thing to do, to say, all right, we're going to close the loop, go all the way upstream to the mine and build our own mines, but I think with a bit of kind of maybe a bit of digging, no pun intended, and a, a bit of research is probably a lot of risk with maybe not much reward and, and outsourcing to Panasonic, outsourcing to other battery makers um, makes complete sense. And when Panasonic said that to Terrell, our number in, in the stories on our website, you can read it. Um, it was a bit of a revelation really, because this is not only is kind of Panasonic accepting that challenge, when the CTO said it on, on stage with me at the, at the Sydney Energy Forum, it's massive. Like it's it's 4X the industry, uh, yeah, four times the industry today. Is that right? Well, four yeah. times tier one, for sure. Four, yeah, yeah. I mean, the industry today is going to be 600 people hours, right? So, and, and this is probably for the mid 2030s, as we think that, that Panasonic are going to aim for that. And of course, Panasonic are not the only supplier uh, to Tesla. And we don't, we also think actually Panasonic will supply other, other car makers with batteries from that Kansas facility, uh, but it's massive and Panasonic are accepting it. And Panasonic are one of the most conservative, yet highest quality and responsible um, battery makers in the world. So yeah, to answer your question, I think uh, this is a, an app, like a, not passing the buck, but like the outsourcing, that supply chain challenge to Panasonic. It wouldn't surprise me if Tesla go and buy a mine just to, or like buy a deposit, just to um, have a bit of negotiating power and a bit of. I'm, I'm like, sure they'll. I'm sure um, they'll do off takes and so on. And if you want to secure a price or whatever and feed it through, but they don't want to be doing. It seems like they're definitely taking a step back here. Yeah, yeah, completely. And to see Panasonic come into the US in a big way, I think it's massive. I think we can't underestimate how big that that move is. And Panasonic also uh, explained they want to build the supply chain. They're not just. It's not just batteries. And, and that's a big statement as well. So, so whilst the government thing might slow down domestic US sources of lithium and nickel and, and cobalt, um, Panasonic will then speed it back up again. So 
it's one to watch. Yeah, Someone I mean, and sort of people. leading on from that question, Simon, you know, if they're going to use, if Panasonic's going to be mostly NCA and NCM, you know, will this make the local supply of raw materials, particularly, you know, nickel now and lithium, you know, a challenge because, well, there's only one uh, high grade nickel sulfide deposit developing company in the US. Um, you know, you have to look around. So, you know, that's going to make it quite a challenge if they're going with those chemistries. Yep. And that, that first 40 gigawatt hours from Kansas is um, NCA. And I think anything additional on top of that, so they go to 100, that probably will definitely be, well, we don't, I'm not sure, but we do know Panasonic want to do NCA as well. In our numbers, we put out a story and I tweeted a chart which showed their raw material demand assuming 50-50 NCA yes. by nickel NCM. And it gives you a problem, right? They're good. I mean, mining company, sorry, uh, companies like Panasonic will end up having to own chunks of mines. I always had this kind of, this narrative thing that I was saying back in March of when OEMs become miners and will OEMs have to be mining companies? What I really meant with that is, will they have to actually invest their own money to own 25% of the project, get it up and running? I think that's going to have to happen. I think Panasonic will have to pursue that strategy as well. Just a turbocharge. Uh, domestic sources. Howard alluded to it earlier, you mentioned five key reasons why lithium won't be an oversupply as a sort of rebuttal. To uh, that was something our lithium uh, and raw materials department put together. I kind of, I saw the Goldman Sachs news. Uh, it was just something, I mean, predicting prices falling or going up is one thing, right? That we're not, we don't have any issues with that. That is what it is. Uh, lithium prices are high, they're going to come off. I mean, that's just the way these, these industries work. But to do it from our perspective without, in a bit of a slapdash way, um, without some rock, rock solid fundamental research uh, was reckless and, and damaging to the industry. And it did the whole industry a disservice. And that's why we stepped up and gave our opinion on the key fundamentals of why their assumptions we thought were, we, were wrong. We disagreed with them. Uh, lipidolite in China is the big one. Uh, again, um, we, Rodney, we were talking about this in DC, I think, and, and it's a, an obvious one that um, low quality, different ores from China, you're not going to be able to bring a, a lot of lithium chemical from these sources as quickly as possible and to use in battery grade material. Um, it's really basic fundamentals. I think also that you have to understand, or people have to understand that the last five years of lithium is a different world to the previous five years, that new mines that are coming on stream are coming on stream at a much, um, at an increased cost to the traditional mines of uh, the Atacama. Um, and so the cost of bringing new mines that increased is therefore the price isn't gonna crash down to previously seen levels or even slightly above. We're definitely in a brave new world for lithium and. and that's why you, I mean, you can read it, you type in benchmark Goldman Sachs lithium into Google, you can read our five assumptions there. And it's basic stuff for, for your audience, for everything Rodney and Howard you talk about, it's basic stuff, but we wanted to reiterate it because what Goldman Sachs put out was, was reckless. Uh, Eric Norris, uh, the president of lithium at um, Albemarle basically said, they disagree with the Goldman report on the demand side um, because I think Albemarle has um, 1.14 or 1.2 you know, for 2020. 1.6. 1.6 they now. They've 1. moved 1. from 1.1 1. 1. 1. 1 to 1.4. Now they're 1.6. 1. 1. So, 1. yeah. Okay. So on the demand side, they're saying Goldman is um, at 1.2. So they disagree on the demand side. And then on the supply side, um, yeah, th this China lipidolite you know, narrative, I think Joe Lowry mentioned, and I think he rightly said that, you know, if China Lipidolite was such a thing, like why, why is like Ganfeng and Tangxi, you know, looking at operations all outside of China, right? The, the, the ones who, who, who know the industry the best. So uh, yeah, the, the Matt Fernley, who we've had on the podcast as well, you know, there's, there's all these generalists out there and, um, and this is a highly specialized, you know, cottage industry of, of analysis here. And uh, lithium is not a commodity. It's not well traded. But for whatever reason, Morgan Stanley a few years ago, Goldman Sachs now, they feel like they need to make like some big contrarian call. 
um, you know, when things have, have kind of risen. And it has, I mean, I looked at Albemarle, Livent, um, SQM, a number of the stocks have fallen precipitously, you know, since that report came out. So as much as we don't want, you know, we think it's bunk, um, it, 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 it has had some market impact because, and this is a weird situation, just given my situation, Simon, like I, I haven't looked at my you know portfolio of stocks for like a long time. And Rodney tells me don't, don't look. Um, so, and, and that's fine. But, but I do recognize these, these, you know, lithium is not an exchange traded commodity or not in any kind of like liquidity. Um, there's all these recession fears. So like the copper price has gone down, you know, and nickel price has gone down. Um, but that's, you, you could do that. The financial speculators can kind of do that, just sell it short. You know, it's not because the the actual supply, you know, inventories are low of those commodities. So, and, and if, if copper goes down, you know, then Freeport goes down enormously. A lot of the stocks have just like, you know, been hit significantly due yeah. to recession fears. But I, I think lithium, the lithium price is interesting. Like they talk about copper being Dr. Copper. I, I, I'm starting to talk about lithium as, as Dr. Lithium um, for, the, for the, the new paradigm energy transition. We all look at kind of like what are EV sales, what are cathode sales to kind of figure out what you know, might happen to lithium as if those things are leading indicators. It might be that lithium is a leading indicator of what, you know, cathode and EV demand are. But the price are going up. Rodney tweeted just yesterday, um, you know, they may have come down maybe 10%, you know, short amount, but the 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 auction by Pilbara, you know, you came out with a very good um, graph the, the other day just showing where Pilbara's price was The principle of the cathode and the, the, the cathode and the downstream for me going forward is if you don't own the mines, if you don't own the physical supply, not a, not a, a contract, not a piece of paper, um, not a loan, not an agreement, uh, physical supply, like owning the mine, owning half of the mine, whatever, then you're not in the game. Then you're, you're literally outsourcing I agree Pretty with you hundred percent. So I mean, yeah. it has to be, it has to be that way. It's no it's other way. It's basic now, right? This is your, your building a fundamental in industry from scratch. And if you don't own the mine, quite simply, you're not in the game. It doesn't mean you're not going to be able to make batteries. It means you cannot guarantee you're making batteries. You cannot guarantee you're going to make EVs. And we're about to go for the next 10 years is going to be the most competitive uh, and cutthroat environment for the EV supply chain ever as we scale so it, it really is as simple as that now and and ask the oems ask the battery guys ask the cafe guys the billions and billions you're putting into your businesses do you want to risk that and whilst they get it you know there's no secrets now in this industry everyone understands what the situation is it's just varying degrees of, of massive demand um the question is at what point someone's going to make the step? You saw BYD trying to do it, dabble, let's say, in, in, in some, in some um, sort of projects in, in Africa. I think there's a lot more to come from BYD. But, um, you, you know, I do think that they are going to have to start owning the mines. It, it, and I feel like I'm repeating myself, but Rodney, as you said, there's, there's no other way to guarantee making an EV. So, I mean, what I don't understand, uh, Simon, is how you can do planning on the downstream when you are going to risk idle capacity. Yeah. I mean, how can you actually commit and start to construct and do it? You're already there in the battery industry and even to an extent in the cathode side. How do you do that when you know you've got idle capacity? Because if you go and ask the incumbents, they're not going to promise you something they can't deliver on. Yeah, but what I find amazing still, you know, look at the track record the last 10 years in the mining and, and, and refining side, it's terrible, right? The, the track record is absolutely terrible at bringing new supply on and scaling capacity and quality. That's not criticism of the market, it's just, uh, it's just a reality, right? A lot of these guys are our customers, but um, it's a terrible track record. So why for the next 10 years where it's about to get so much more aggressive, would you risk that? I just don't get it. But which is which is the point that, that that I make, Simon, is if you look at the current and incumbent and future supply from incumbent versus future total supply, the percentage of greenfield and non-conventional flow sheets 
is growing and growing and growing into the expected supply chain. Now, if incumbents can't do brownfield expansion on time, on budget, and qualify, how the hell is a greenfield going to do it? If they'll get there, I'm sure a lot of the projects will get there, but the reality is you're going to have a problem. It's part of the reason why it's not ideal and it doesn't play into the localized supply chain. But to us, the logical thing is produce bodium and send it to spare capacity in China. Yeah. But um, because it's not ideal, but if you need the material, you know, you, have you noticed you haven't heard anywhere where Tesla, Ford, et cetera, are going to take their offtakes from LG are going to take it from Liontown and where they're going to process it. Downstream, believe the upstream. They believe them when they say that's something. And they might believe them 70%, not 100%, but they, they believe a big chunk of what they're saying. And again, I'm not saying the mining guys are lying. I'm just saying the track record's awful and there's, there's a lot of risk. So that's problem number one. Problem number two is 99% of this industry weren't in the industry, let's call it, battery, raw materials, supply chain, but not in the industry five, six, seven years ago. So they haven't experienced the failure part of it yet. They've just probably seen raw materials going up the last two years. Um, you know, and that, that's something that has to be bridged and it has to change, but we'll see. Well, Volkswagen uh, seems to be spinning off into this power company, you know, in, in IPO. And I think in uh, an article I saw last week, indicated that that company would secure raw materials. So maybe, um, the, the, I know Robert Friedland has said that the auto industries are so fearful of their brand, right? You know, if there's some tailings dam disaster, um, you know, Volkswagen's directly invested in a mine, it's too risky. But if, yeah. they, have, if they make the investments through a subsidiary, which is this power co, right? Th th then th th there, there's some distance between them. And maybe that gets back to the point of Tesla prospectively outsourcing this to Panasonic, but I haven't seen Panasonic's name come up in any offtake agreement. I know there's Sumitomo Metal and Mining maybe is, is an arm of theirs, but you know, whereas we've seen LG be reasonably aggressive, we haven't seen yeah. FK. Um, LG actually made an investment in Tangxi's Hong Kong IPO, right? So mm. they're investing in a company, not in a, in a mine, but it, it, it is a bit of a, um, you know, a strong relationship there. Um, but, um, you know, I guess it's to be seen. We all agree that they, they, they're they starting to write checks. I think this Ford Lion Town is, is a meaningful development. It was $300 million. It is a loan, but it, it's a low interest loan. Yeah. Got to qualify, but it's a means to secure a supply. Um, you saw Stellantis invest in Vulcan, um, you know, 8% uh, or so 50 million euro check. So checks are starting, they're small, uh, but meaningful in the same way that this government funding is small, but meaningful. I think it, it will have a trajectory, uh, you know, it will accelerate in my opinion. Yeah, um, I, do, I do think these, these little things that you're mentioning, that they would have been really useful in 2016. You know, like it, it, it's the, the, the wall is here. We always talked about a wall of demand approaching. It's here. This is the year. This, the energy storage revolution has begun this year. 50 or 40 percent battery growth. The industry is growing 40 percent this year. Uh, lithium ion battery cells. 40 percent. That's that's an industry on top of an industry. That was the size of the, the battery industry in 2019. The industry on top of an industry. So these little things help but they would have been good in 2016. And, and there's going to be so many casualties, like, like from, a, from a, um, a major EV maker perspective, major businesses will have to look at themselves and go, and it might not dawn this year, it might not be next, maybe the year after, but big parts of their businesses will fail because they can't get the batteries, because they can't get the raw materials. It becomes really as fundamental as that. And yeah, I mean, I do think Panasonic is definitely one to watch. I think 2023 will be the year of Panasonic in the USA and the year of Pan maybe in Europe, but certainly in the USA. And I think Panasonic's approach to building the, an ecosystem and the supply chain is when they when Panasonic move, they they move, I think, and and, and they have decided to move. So I think that's crucial as well. 
they've also been working on the 4680 format and so on. So they, they seem to have sort of caught up on, on that front. Um, uh, so Simon, you've got the title for your next article and call Lithium the Existential Crisis of, of, uh, of the auto industry, because um, it, it, it is true. I mean, in, in essence, they could be a busted flush. But um, so one other topic uh, I wanted to touch on, which is always an interesting one, is when I went to the benchmark uh, event in Cape Town this year, back in person, saw Casper and co. The one thing I noticed was the forecast still of a transition to nickel-based cathodes um, by 2030. So can you just talk a little about how that interplays with LFP? Yeah, our models didn't shift to an LFP majority, um, but they did shift to LFP, LFP significantly increasing its, its market share. Definitely NCA dominant, high nickel, not 811 necessarily, but certainly the, the 622s and a little bit higher. We see as kind of dominant chemistries this year. I do think LF, the LFP story was a little bit overcooked, uh, and people got a little bit excited, um, and for good reason, right? It makes I understood the principles behind it. But then it's funny as soon as the raw material prices start going, as soon as lithium carbonate prices prices start going for the roof, no one hears about LFP now, and and you know the LFP cost profile completely changed, and it's almost like the battery cell became as volatile as the raw material. I think the cost per kilowatt hour now is, is no different. So it comes down to a energy density differential. So it does really swing. You're right. I mean, it's, it yeah. is volatile. When your battery cell becomes as volatile as your lithium price, uh, it's kind of, uh, you, you know, you have the same challenge. And so, so I do think LFP is a really good way of scaling lithium ion batteries quickly. Now, of course, Lithium is your, your limiting factor there. So unless, unless you have a lithium mine, you're not going to be scaling uh, LFP quickly. And, and so I think that's the story of the last 18 or 12 months. The LFP train has slowed. Lithium price has gone through the roof. And therefore, I think, um, I, I think NCM and NCA will be coming back um, over the next two years as a you know, world, world class quality lithium ion battery. Of course, the problem is you've got you've got five supply chains to master, not just the the one with LFP. I don't really count iron and phosphate as as big issues, um, and so that's something to consider as well. R related to this, uh, CATL uh, it was reported maybe making a five billion dollar investment in Mexico or possibly the U.S. Um, they're a Tesla supplier um, you know, of LFP. Um, do you think the USA would allow CATL to invest in batteries in the United States? And I'm wondering in what political environment that would happen. It would, I mean, I, I do think lithium ion batteries and a CATL gigafactory in the USA could well be an olive branch to cool tensions of the last, what, five years. And, and that probably will happen at some point, I think. So I just, can't, I don't know when. I don't. Know, I don't think it will be the, maybe the Biden administration that do that. It's too against the narrative of uh, the momentum of of, um, of USA versus China. But yeah, to answer your question, within the next four years, yes, so I can see a CATL gigafactory in the USA. Okay, and do you have any idea if this is? you know, LFP that they're looking at, um, it, it, all the gigafactories that you talked about you know, in the United States, are, are they are they all or almost all nickel-based? Um, all NCM, pretty, uh, unless I've got to look at the database, but pretty much all NCM except for Tesla gigafactory in Texas, uh, sorry, in Nevada. Okay, which is NCA, right? But there was still nickel. Was Panasonic, yep. yeah. Yeah. Last year, when the Biden administration put out their first 100-day thing, um, Andy Holm at Reuters wrote a very good article um, basically saying that you know, flagging a key takeaway of, of that report, which covered a lot of the materials, but basically said the United States government should invest in nickel refining capacity in coordination with allies. If there are opportunities for the U.S. to target one part of the battery supply chain, this would likely be the most critical to provide short and medium term supply chain stability for the, the, the government to flag this and for Andy Holm to you know, recognize what's your sense about 
that because there's not there's only one nickel mine in America. Any right. thoughts on on that, given that all of the chemistries you just mentioned are nickel based, right? And and we're reliant yeah. on Indonesia for a lot of it. And now with the Ukraine war, you know, in Russia, Russia, I don't know what is 15 or 20 percent of the, the class one nickel supply. I mean, we're this is a very serious um, supply chain issue. Uh 100% needed, right? You know, you have to build the, not just the mine level, you have to build the midstream and, and so on. And nickel, I mean, it comes from a downstream perspective, right? If you've got 75% of battery cell capacity in China, I'm looking at the stats now, 92% of cathode capacity is in China, 92%, right? Uh, anode, 91%, right? So add that in there as well. Next step upstream, um, Panasonic, for example, building the Kansas Gigafactory, 60,000 tons of nickel chemical, yeah, 60,000 tons a year of nickel chemical they're going to need for that one gigafactory, 40 gigawatt hours. And so the answer is exactly in the kind of answers I gave before, nickel chemical, uh, nickel hydroxide especially, um, is badly needed in the USA, just like lithium hydroxide. Um, and I do, I, I mean, cobalt is important to have cobalt resilience, I think. Um, so that's why, I, you know, I do think, just like rare earths, but uh, you need mine level and refining level for cobalt and rare earths for more of a long-term resilience, less of a, a, um, a large scale demand thing. But for me, lithium and nickel are your two massive bottlenecks, scale, quality, speed. We're going to put you a bit on the spot here and ask it. I mean, we have a, I have a view. Guess everyone has a view, but what is your expected average price for battery grade carbon and hydroxide for 2023? Um, so I'm going to give my opinion, which I, I hope it tallies with our <laughs> forecasting plan, but it might not. I mean, I'm separate from that uh, deliberately for, for, for many reasons, including regulatory reasons. But um, from conversations I've been having and thinking about it, I, I do think that the next three years, so if I'm a, if I'm a, a battery or an EV maker, for the next three years, I've got to be, if I can keep lithium between 35 and $45 a kilo for big contracts, then I mean, that's, yeah, I'm doing sounds a good right. job. I'm doing a good that's, job. You're very similar to us. I think that that reads through to, on Spodgerman, you must still be north of $3,000 a tonne. You've got a structural problem in lithium. It's not a structural oversupply like Goldman Sachs said. It's a structural undersupply. And we're just seeing it this year. It's just begun this year. So uh, it makes sense. And if that's the, the accurate price, um, you know, Cowan and company, David Deckelbaum, in his recent presentation, which was our last video, uh, and his research, I think he indicated that you know, Albemarle, Allchem, Livent, you know, if you, if you look at their valuations, it, it seems that they're pricing in an expectation of around fifteen to twenty thousand dollars a ton. So, if you're right, um, these things are substantially undervalued or mispricing. Um, you know, the, the mispricing where uh, lithium prices are going to be over the next few years and the cash flow generating potential of those big cap companies. But this also applies for near term producers um, of spodumene, like you know, um, the Sigma or. Yeah, uh, or or or, or, or Kool, Atlantic or, or, or yeah. Atlantic, Siona, Piedmont, um, as well as uh, Lithium Americas from Minera XR. So that there's a number of new producers that are not yet generating revenue and cash flow. That if you're right, Simon, you know, and 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 these companies are going to transition to be priced on, you know, earnings multiples as opposed to NAV multiples. And you know, so just if you look at 2024, 25, 26 guidance um yeah they're substantial undervalued um especially for companies that are fully funded and have no funding risk we know what can potentially come online in the time frame that you're talking about we can't really be that far wrong right we everything is on the table if it's not under construction or already completed or what have you it's not going to make it in that timeline to affect the market so yeah uh, that's, I guess, so the only thing is a rug pull on demand, which we're not seeing at the moment. If anything, waiting times have risen. So. 315, 315 gigafactories in the pipeline, 147 yeah. active by the end of this year, but many more are going to be active next year. So these are hubs, these are the, your orbs, your hubs of demand that suck up these raw materials. 
there's a load coming on next year, let alone all the stuff that's that's just starting this year. Yeah. Um, that that for me as a simple story, that rise of the gigafactories or dawn of the, the battery gigafactories, I take inspiration from the Planet of the Apes movies, um, is 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 just here. <laughs>